All right, and welcome back. So this is the second half of Early Medieval. Let's just get right into it. So when we last left off, we were talking about uh, art of the British Isles and art of the Viking period. And I think it might be a good idea to just go back to the timeline, just to give you a sense of where we're talking about. So we're talking about this period that essentially goes from uh, about the end of the fifth century uh, all the way up into about the year 900s. So we have Goths and Italy and Lombards. This is the time of the Vandals. The Anglo-Saxon expansion happens over about the 6th to the uh, 8th century. And then by the time we get to uh, the 8th into the 9th century, we have the Viking expansion going on. So we talked about the Vikings, and the Vikings actually go quite late. Uh, Viking era is usually, uh, the end of the Viking era is usually described as 1066. That's when William the Conqueror uh, um, comes over from Normandy and conquers the Anglo-Saxons, and pretty much the descendants of William the Conqueror have been ruling England ever since. Uh, the Queen of England is like the 29th generation uh, great-grandchild of William the Conqueror. It's kind of amazing. I think one family has held it that long. Uh, but we're going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to go back to the 6th century, and this time, instead of looking at what's happening in the North Countries and what's happening in the British Isles, we're going to look at what's happening in France and what's happening in the continent. So what's happening in France and what's happening in the continent is a group of individuals we call the Merovingians. This is the first Frankish dynasty. So the Franks, or who become the French, are this Germanic tribe that move in. The founder is Clovis. Uh, he conquers this region, converts to Christianity, uh, and he's gone by 511. And the artwork that we're seeing them produce is very, very similar to the artwork we saw in the British Isles, particularly the earlier stuff. You can see that it uses the cloisonné technique. If we take a look over here, for example, I'll pull out the pen. This is cloisonné. Uh, it uses that compartmentalized gold wire and uses garnets in settings. But you'll notice there's a cross here. So they are Christians. They have converted to Christianity and accepted these ideas. Notice that we have faces. We have hidden items hidden in the decoration. There's very much this love of ornament. Here we have a ring. This is the ring here. And there's a larger version up here. This is a signet ring. And in this case, this is the signet ring of Arnagundus. And you can see the name is there in the Latin. Uh, inscribed around it. So they had adopted Latin, they had adopted Christianity as their language, but the artwork is still this barbarian or migrational style. Uh, back in the 16th century, they actually uncovered the tomb of Childeric. Childeric was one of these uh, descendants or ancestors, excuse me, of Clovis. And you can see that he had this incredible panoply of weapons and also of bridle mounts and uh, horse, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it, furniture, uh, horse decorations. These are things that would fit on the bridles. These are things that would also fit on the shapes of swords and the hilts of swords. And it's again, this cloisonné, uh, this garnet settings that have uh, separated with gold wire. Here you can see a couple of horse heads Hopefully you can see those. So we have a couple of horse heads there that are you know, pretty easy to make out. These horse heads right here. But there were also bees and a number of other things. Unfortunately, most of this treasure uh, was stolen and actually melted down by a couple of thieves. And very uh, few parts of it were recovered. That's why we only have drawings of it instead of photos, because it was stolen from before the era of photographs. But a few of these objects still exist. Here were a series of bees. Notice that the bees themselves are made up out of gold. They have cloisonné with garnet wings. Those garnets cover a, a cross-hatching technique that's carved into the gold so that the gold is, uh, you know, kind of scintillating underneath it. And there were lots of these bees found, and these bees probably decorated a cloak. So there were dozens of these little bees uh, studded on a cloak that he wore. These bees were so influential that when they were just, uh, kind of discovered uh, that Napoleon actually took this as a theme and made it use of it as a theme uh, because this was one of the first French dynasties and he wanted to be associated with it. Likewise, you can see this is the hilt and the shapes of a sword. And you can see it's set in with this beautiful cloisonné uh, garnet 
You can even see some of that cross-hatching work underneath it. Uh, the pommel here actually has uh, the head of what is a dragon that would have covered up the iron sword that would have gone down the center of the tang and the iron sword is long since rusted away. So we can see that it's really not all that different. It's very much like uh, the kind of decoration that we're seeing amongst the Anglo-Saxons and the Hiberno-Saxons as well. As we move on to the 7th century, the Merovingians, you can see that even when we move to textiles, and here we have a shirt, this is the shirt of Batilda, uh, the shirt decoration here is emulating that same kind of cloisonné technique. So this is all embroidery, but it's meant to emulate that cloisonné inset stone technique. The cross here is embroidery, but they have imagined it as a cross hanging from a golden collar or livery collar, and it's studded with pearls and stones. This looks very much like the Byzantine stuff we've seen. And then there's also roundels that are down here as well that show roundels and bust portraits of saints. The Merovingians also had a love of manuscript illustration. Generally, Merovingian manuscripts are seen as not as sophisticated as their counterparts over in the British Isles, for example, but they still have lots of fun things going on. One of the things that we talk about is this uh, concept of the historiated capital. This is where uh, a letter is actually illustrated to be a, uh, a work of art. Here we see another processional cross decorated in all of this wonderful uh, color. And from the cross are hanging two pendants, and the pendants are in the shape of little fish. But they make the Greek letters alpha and omega, which is a reference, of course, to the scriptural story of Christ being Alpha and Omega. We see a similar pendant cross over here with the scenes of Alpha and Omega on them and little birds uh, attaching to them. And again, the emphasis here is this is similar, very similar to uh, metalworking at the time, which had actual pendants hanging from it. We look elsewhere in the Jalone Sacramentary, you can see uh, some really imaginative uh, workings. Here we have a figure. She is carrying a cross and she is dressed up as a Byzantine princess and she carries a censer. And she's standing on a letter and she forms part of this letter. Same thing with Christ over here. Christ actually forms a letter T that continues the text to his right. So this is both the letter T, but it's also the image of the crucified Christ with the blood coming out of his side. Generally, the decorations tend to be flatter, and uh, while they're not as well designed, I think, as something like the Book of Kells, it's very, very similar. Here's a, another wonderful example. I love this. This is the letter A, and the letter A is here made up out of an eel and a fish, and the fish is wound around the eel. Uh, again, it's very kind of similar ornament, where the ornament has animals uh, interlacing back upon themselves to bite themselves. Well, the Merovingians um, are the actual royal family, uh, but they quickly get eclipsed by their own uh, captain of the guard. A character by the name of Charles Martel comes along, and Charles Martel's title is the uh, mayor of the palace. And this is a title, you know, kind of more or less equivalent to something like the captain of the guard or the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And even though he's technically not the king, he is the power behind the throne. He doesn't have any title to nobility, but he has the military behind him. And increasingly, the Frankish Merovingian kings become more and more irrelevant. They just become uh, figureheads, while uh, Charles and his descendants uh, pretty much dominate and take control. And he and his descendants are all pretty much named Charles. Lots of them are named Charles. And of course, the term for Charles in Latin is Carolus. And so we call this group of people the Carolingians because it was a dynasty of people named Charles. By far the most important of these characters is a guy named Charlemagne. And Charlemagne had the title of mayor of the palace, and he actually inherited that from uh, his dad, I believe he's the great-grandson of Charles Martel, 
but he inherits the title of mayor of the palace, and in all intents and purposes, he was functionally the king of the Franks, but he didn't have this legitimacy, but he did have power. So one day, uh, he goes down to Italy to celebrate uh, Mass on Christmas uh, in uh, Rome. And while he kneels down to actually, uh, you know, honor the altar, the Pope, Pope Leo, sneaks up behind him and places a crown on his head and declares him to be the Holy Roman Emperor. And then he's like, has this Miss America moment where he's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Uh, but the truth is, he did have. It was almost certainly planned in advance. Uh, see, it turns out the Pope had a problem. He had Lombards on his back in northern Italy, and they were pestering him, and he needed protection. Uh, Charlemagne had all the mo had all the money and all the power in the world, and but he didn't have legitimacy. He didn't have actually any kind of claimed title. So instead, what happens? He goes down and he makes a deal with the Pope. Pope declares him Holy Roman Emperor. That's how he gets his legitimacy. He can't get any more legitimate than the Pope. And then he agrees to give military protection to the Pope's back uh, yard and back door where he's being threatened by these other people, the Lombards. Uh, he also grants the Pope kind of title to the lands around him. And this is the beginning of the Papal States. So this is the establishment of what we call the Holy Roman Empire, where we see this reconstruction of an attempt to recreate the Roman Empire. This is one of the first times in medieval history where people realize, you know what? Things have kind of gotten downhill since the end of the Roman Empire. We don't have the legions, we don't have the aqueducts, uh, we don't have the social institutions. So this is a conscientious attempt by both the Pope and Charlemagne, uh, which is Charles the Great in French, Carolus Magnus. Uh, this is an attempt by them to recreate the ideas of the Roman state. And so here we have a statuette of perhaps Charlemagne. It's probably Charles the Bald, his grandson, but either way. Uh, and it shows him riding a horse. Well, riding a horse was an equestrian portrait. This was a Roman idea. And so you see the recreation of all these Roman ideas, an attempt to recreate the high culture of the late antique period of that golden age of Constantine and the first Christian Roman emperors. Uh, Richard Krautheimer, very famous uh, architectural historian, uh, retermed this period the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, and it's a series of renaissances from now on. What we see in the Middle Ages is from this point onward, an attempt to reclaim the classical past, to reclaim classical art, to reclaim uh, classical institutions. And so while the big Renaissance is the Renaissance that happens in Italy in the 15th century, this might be termed a Renaissance as well, a kind of rebirth, a conscientious attempt to reclaim the past. And you can see this in everything that he does. He creates a permanent capital, he establishes monasteries as artistic centers, he revives all this late classical tradition. Let me give you some examples. So in addition to reviving some iconography, such as the equestrian portrait, which we see here, we see him build an actual palace. Now that may seem kind of, well, yeah, so what? He's a king, why wouldn't he have a palace? Well, the truth is the Frankish kings up until that point did not live in palaces. Remember, these people are the descendants of barbarians and semi-nomads. These are people who rode around in the saddle of a horse. Uh, the Merovingian kings lived in tents and traveled from place to place. They didn't have a lot of permanent buildings. So this is the first time that one of these Frankish kings actually tries to attempt to build a palace. And the palace has many features that you would associate with Rome. For one, it has a large audience hall. So let's go take a look at this. Here you have a large audience hall. Hall. This looks a lot like a basilica. Uh, so remember that uh, Alla Palantina of Constantine in Trier, Germany. Uh, this looks very much like it. Uh, it also has a bathhouse. Remember, Romans liked to bathe. So, you know, any well-respecting Roman emperor, even a holy Roman emperor, uh, would have to have a bathhouse. By the way, it's a complete myth that people in the Middle Ages didn't bathe. They bathed all the time. Uh, they had bathhouses. Uh, they, they bathed. Heck, they even had weddings in hot tubs. It's kind of crazy. 
Uh, it was the early modern period, the 15th and 16th century, where bathing falls out of custom and people stop bathing because they thought that it was a source of disease. Uh, it's all the ugly, nasty things that we associate with the Middle Ages. Most of them are BS. Um, you know, it's the Spanish Inquisition is the early modern period. That's where the persecution comes. The persecution of witches doesn't happen in the Middle Ages. That's an early modern thing. Um, the lack of bathing, uh, all of that. So, eh, just trying to disabuse you of some uh, myths. Oh, and all those horrible evil torture devices you see that are from the Middle Ages, like the Iron Maiden or the Pair of Agony, all that's BS too. All of that was invented after the fact. The Middle Ages were long and gone when those were invented. Oh, well. Uh, we credit the Middle Ages with a lot of bad things, but the truth is they invented a lot of good things. So he's got his throne room. He's got his bathhouse. The other thing he needs is he needs a royal chapel. And here is the royal chapel. And this building is still around. Uh, it's been vastly modified. It's got a huge Gothic uh, choir built onto it. And the upper portion, basically everything from about, oh, here up is uh, new. But most of this is original down here. Uh, it would have looked like this. And you'll notice that it's a centrally planned building. It has an open courtyard and a little balcony so he can come out and greet the crowds. And the reason you would have a circularly planned structure is this is in reference to the great churches of the East. Remember, the Byzantine Empire is still out there. There's still an emperor in the East. And remember the Basilica of San Vitale or the Church of the, the Holy Sepulcher. Those were all centrally planned structures and they are all kind of a materium style building. So when he's building a structure like this, this gets added on later, you can ignore this part, but when he's building this kind of structure, he's clearly trying to reference the imperial buildings of people like Justinian in the East. He's trying to say, hey, I'm an emperor of the West, just like they're an emperor of the East. And so when you take a look at it to the interior, it does in fact look very Byzantine. Uh, the lower levels are in fact decorated with what we call book matched marble. So you have this marble slabs that are cut into thin slabs and you can see how they're book matched. It's very beautiful. Uh, we have this beautiful kind of polychromy on the arches. We have mosaics. These are all Byzantine forms of ornament. This is mostly reconstruction, but it gives a sense of what this thing would have looked like. He's clearly trying to say, I'm an emperor like the Byzantine emperor. He places a throne up there, and the throne has a couple of different purposes. Uh, one, if you remember the Roman emperors of the past, and you remember something like the Colosseum, that served a very important function. Roman emperors were not like kings of the ancient Near East or Egypt, where the kings were seen as somehow semi divine or sacred, and they could not be seen by commoners. Romans and Roman emperors were supposed to be the first among equals, and they were supposed to be accessible, and any Roman citizen could make his appeal to Caesar. We actually see this happen if you read the New Testament. Paul makes his appeal all the way to Caesar, which is why he ends up going to Rome. Uh, he was a Roman citizen and had that right. So as the Holy Roman Emperor is an attempt to try to recreate this idea of an emperor, he wants to be accessible too, but you can't be too accessible because if you're down at the level of commoners, then you get knives in your back and things like that. It's still a nasty world. So he puts a throne here, right there, on the second level, but it's there deliberately so that people can see him. So much like the emperor of ancient Rome going to the Colosseum, and this was a place where people could see their ruler and have access to him. Uh, this throne here uh, was meant to emulate stylistically, at least in concept, the throne of the King of Solomon. Uh, not the King of Solomon, King Solomon. So if you know your Bible, you know that uh, David um, begat Solomon and uh, Solomon begets, I guess, Jeroboam. Uh, and they established the kings of the Israel before it splits into the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Uh, remember, Charlemagne doesn't have uh, any kind of claim to the throne other than just pure power. And so if you want a claim to the throne, you have to create this kind of imagery that uh, builds up your persona. And one of the things he did is he took on the identity of Solomon. Uh, 
He builds this building, much like Solomon builds a temple. He uh, puts a lot of money into the arts, just like Solomon did. In fact, he had a kind of cabinet of officials that he gathered around himself. These officials were uh, members of an of a organization that really were trying to rebuild classical civilization and trying to rebuild it, but in a new Christian medieval way. And they all had code names for each other, and they took those code names from the court of King David from the Bible and of King Solomon. So his code name was King Sol. His name was Solomon. Uh, this is also where I break the hearts of. Uh, some of your grandmothers, uh, please don't share this with them. I'm sure this being Utah, uh, everyone has uh, seen those people who have those ancestral charts that go all the way back to Adam. Well, where do those ancestral charts come from? They come usually from people tying their genealogy back into French royalty. Most of the French royalty claim descent in some way from Charlemagne. Charlemagne is an incredibly important figure. He's He's kind of claimed as a a foundational figure by both Germans and French. And so they write themselves into the story of Charlemagne. Well, Charlemagne had his courtiers make up a genealogy for him, and they, you know, didn't have a genealogy of any important kings they could find, so they kind of invented one. And they tied him into the most important genealogy you can find, the genealogy of King David and Solomon himself. Uh, so any of those charts that you find, basically what that means is they found a way to tie themselves back into Charlemagne and then took that back to David. Uh, so it's almost certainly fake. It's almost certainly something that he had produced to uh, make this claim of authority, uh, but he doesn't really, uh, you know, deserve it. So uh, please don't break your grandmother's heart. Don't tell her I told you so, <laughs> but uh, probably, probably not true. Uh, but it shows how he was thinking this way. He thought every part of society, how do we remake society? Uh, he had one of his um, uh, courtiers, it was a close counselor to him, was a guy named Einhard. And Einhard was a dwarf. He was very, very clever. He was a worker in silver. Um, but he was very, very clever. Uh, and he eventually wrote the biography of Charlemagne. Uh, and so if you want to know where George Martin got the idea for you know, Tyrion... Uh, this clever dwarf that somehow got his hands in everybody's pies, that's where it comes from. Again, George Martin, world's greatest plagiarist. Uh, if you plagiarize things from the past, nobody can get you on it, people. So just, just go to history and steal things from there. Uh, don't steal modern authors, steal past authors. Uh, and he really was a clever guy, but he again makes, uh, in his biography of Charlemagne, uh, Einhard makes Charlemagne out to be this great king, and a lot of that has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, here's another one that's actually fun. Uh, Theodore of Orléans. Theodore of Orléans was one of his counselors, and he uh, charges Theodore of Orléans with rewriting the liturgy. Christianity had been growing up for several centuries by this time, and there was an amazing array of different rituals and masses. You could actually travel from one town to the other, and the mass would be completely different. It might be given in a native language, it might be given in Latin. There was no rhyme or reason to it. So he said, let's make the Libri Carolini, make these series of books. And these books were poems and hymns and psalters and songs to reform the liturgy. And he causes them to reform the liturgy so that everybody is essentially on the same page that they're singing the same songs they're practicing the same mass he needed to unify his empire so he used the church to do that and those songs are still around so if you are a member of the predominant faith of the utah valley apologies to all you uh non-members i don't mean to leave you out but if you're a member of of that faith or even if you're a member of a common christian of common Protestant or Catholic faith, uh, go check out your hymnals. Uh, All Glory, Laud, and Honor uh, is a song written by Theodore of Orleans. It's in the Mormon hymnal. It's in lots of Christian hymnals. Catholics, Christians, Mormons, we're still singing these songs today. I bet you had no idea uh, that we're still influenced in this way. Uh, if you wonder why the Catholic Church moved to almost exclusively Latin, this was one of the reasons. And again, this is where we're going to tweak a misconception of the Middle Ages, that everybody thinks, oh, well, they went to Latin because they wanted to keep people ignorant. Actually, no, everybody already was ignorant. Uh, most people couldn't read or write in any language, uh, but the people who could, could read and write in Latin. And so the move towards Latin was not an attempt to 
obscure things. It was an attempt to make it more uniform. It was the lingua franca of the region. It was the language that all educated people could speak, and so it was actually kind of a liberating uh, stance. And then it just became traditional, um, using it uh, to keep people from uh, learning things. That wasn't the intent. So that's another misconception you might have. Every part of this society was about reinventing things. This is a fabulous document. This document was actually found in a library. They were repairing another book, and they took the binding apart, and when they took the binding apart, this thing fell out. Somebody decided, ah, I need to pad the binding a little bit, and so I'll just fold this up and stuff it in there. Uh, and it's a kind of a miracle that this thing survived. Uh, and this is actually an architectural plan for an ideal monastic community. And it came from this time period of the Carolingians. And it shows how they were reinventing all of society. So here's a, a black and white drawing of it. Let me just kind of walk you through what this thing is. So at the, at the center, you have a church. If you have a monastic community, you have to have a church. This is called the Plan of St. Gaul. So this is the church. Uh, if you have a church and you have monks, you have to have a cloister where people could gather. You have a refectory. This is a cafeteria for the monks to eat. Uh, being a monk should come with some perks. So there's actually uh, a winery <laughs> where they make wine and mead and beer and other things. You have a graveyard for all of the deceased brothers. You have a hospital over here for people who are sick. And you have a hostel, uh, a place for pilgrims over here. You have everything from hen houses, you have places uh, to manufacture goods, blacksmith shops, all kinds of things. Uh, and these were really self-contained cities. And by building these monasteries across the empire, they became ideal administrative centers where you could uh, produce law courts. He didn't have the social institutions, he didn't have the legions that the Romans did, but he did have the church. So the church takes on many of the social institutions that the ancient Roman Empire used to. The most important thing here is stables. They have places for horses. So if you heard of some horrible news out on the edge of the empire, you could get their lickety split by taking your men to the next monastery, trading out the horses, and getting all fresh horses and supplies and taking off to the new monastery and where you would trade horses again. So you could Pony Express style trade horses until you got to where the threat was on the edge of the empire. And so these become major military centers, uh, major administrative centers, um, and really kind of self-contained cities. But the other thing they become is major centers of artistic production. We don't remember this, that you know monasteries are economic ventures. These monks got to support themselves, they got to live. And so they had all kinds of economic ventures, but one of the biggest and most important is making manuscripts. So we've already talked how manuscripts were tools of conversion for people who were pagan, but they were also tools and resources for the monks themselves. The monks have an obligation to pray for everyone to hold these masses and rituals, and so they would want these books to be as fancy as possible. This is a demonstration of the front and back cover of the Lindau Gospels. And it's a great example because it shows just how styles were changing. The back cover actually probably comes from about 20 years earlier than the front cover. So this is the front cover right here. This is the back cover. Let me just put a B over here for back and F for front. Uh, and you'll notice there's some stylistic differences. This one still has the cloisonne, it has the enamel inlays, has this beautiful interlacing, it has a very flat graphic quality. Everything except for these little corner roundels which seem to have been added in the 15th century. But everything else other than these little roundels here is very much in the style of the previous era. And it shows a lot of similarities with things like the Book of the Kells. But check out the front cover. Couldn't be more different. All that interlacing is gone. Instead, it's rep re replaced with set jewels. We have repousse. This is hammered gold into the shape of Jesus Christ standing on the cross. He has classical drapery. We see angels and other figures that also have more classical representative drapery. And so there's this move towards greater classicism away from abstraction and flat and graphic styles to more classical styles. 
uh, when you open up these manuscripts, um, this is a different manuscript, this is the Coronation Gospels, you can see this exact same trend. Take a look at this. Holy cow. Uh, so these are pages from the Coronation Gospels. The Coronation Gospels were called the Coronation Gospels because many, 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 many years later uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, they exhumed the body of Charlemagne and they found this book on his chest. He was buried with it. And they took it out and they were so wrapped with the beauty of it that they kept the book out. And this book was used in the coronation of every Holy Roman Emperor since that time uh, until the Holy Roman Empire came to an end in the early 19th century. You can understand why they loved it. First of all, it's just a lavish manuscript made on parchment. The parchment pages are dyed red and purple, so they don't even look like parchment. They have this incredible, luxurious red color. But then the other thing is the incredible skill of the representation. Everything about this thing is completely different than the Book of Kells. And yet this thing is probably made maybe 20, 25 years of the same time as the Book of Kells. You'd never guess it. So just right across the English Channel from where, well, I guess you have to go, Book of Kells is probably made... It's actually probably made in, in Scotland. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it's probably made in a little island north of Scotland, Iona. Uh, but it came to rest in, in Ireland. But just across from the British Isles, across the Irish Sea, across England, across the English Channel, over into France, you'll get something like this. This is made by the Palace School, which was uh, at the palace in Aachen, Germany. Look at the drapery. We have classical drapery. Notice how the drapery wraps around the figure, revealing the figure. They're wearing classical dress. They're wearing togas. We have a real sense of space, a background with landscape. Uh, there is a sense of dimension. This throne is uh, receding into space. The figures look naturalistic. They have a high degree of modeling. Uh, I love their little toes and sandals and the features. They are encased in square frames, and it's hard to see here, but those square frames have acanthus scroll work. This is very, very classical looking. Let's just jump back, if we can, to the Book of Kells and show you just how different this really is. So if we jump back to the Book of Kells, holy criminy, there's no sense of modeling here. There's no sense of the contours of the body. The figures are just rendered out as flat graphics. Instead of a canthus scroll in the frames, we have interlacing. Uh, it's a graphic masterpiece, no doubt, but it couldn't be less classical if you tried. Now let's go back to the Coronation Gospels. Looking back at the Coronation Gospels, night and day difference. So something really big is happening. You're seeing this movement back to classicism, this movement back to modeling human proportion. Is it perfect? No. Uh, one thing that's always bothered me about these guys is that uh, this is Mark over here. These are author portraits. These are the portraits of the gospel of the authors of the of the gospels, and this is I believe this is Mark over here. Uh, but if you look at his shoulder region, it's like how does his arm connect exactly? I mean, this drapery around the thigh is amazing, but what's going on over here? So it's not perfect. It's not as high level as we would see in the classical era. But remember, there'd been a loss of knowledge. And again, that loss of knowledge didn't necessarily happen because they hated the classical knowledge. It just there's a change in style. There was a change in style. You can see some of these same features in the uh, Ebo Gospels, or the Ebo Gospels, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, this is from the Roms school. Roms is another one of these uh, cities that uh, established a, a center of artistic production. And here, in this case, uh, you can still see the same ideas. Love to see how the drapery runs around here. It gets tucked up underneath his thigh. Uh, it really reveals the figure. We have a real sense of depth uh, back here. This is Matthew in this case, because we have an angel back here, a human. That's the symbol of Matthew. This is an eagle, so this is John. And John is working over here. But there's a much greater sense of death, a much greater sense of classicism. You can see the frames are using acanthus and gold leaf. Beautiful stuff. The artist here uses a very, very frenetic line. I always think these things look a little bit like uh, Dr. Seuss sketches. Uh, they're really fun. They're really energetic. Um, but energetic in a completely different way than, say, the Hiberno-Saxon manuscripts. The Rome School is incredibly innovative, and it's here where we see some of the best innovations we've ever seen in manuscript illustration.
Manuscript illustration, again, is a relatively new thing. You have to realize that we haven't been illustrating manuscripts all that long. This is something that arrives mostly with the Christian tradition, and the Christians expand upon it. Some things are easy to illustrate, like if you're doing an author portrait. This is the guy who wrote the book, so you do it. If you have a narrative scene, you can do that. But here, we see a unique challenge and an amazing innovation to how you deal with illustration. This is the Utrecht Psalter. This comes out of the ROM school. It's currently in the Utrecht University Library. Um, but it's called the Utrecht Psalter because it's a psaltery. A psaltery is a collection of psalms. Quick point, uh, what we consider to be the Bible, that is, all of the books of the Bible gathered together in a single volume, really didn't exist in the Middle Ages. There are very few full-volume Bibles in the Middle Ages. Instead, what you would have is you would have uh, a whole collection of books and those books would suit different purposes. You would have a gospel book for reading the gospels. You would have um, what's called a Pentateuch or an Octateuch, which is the first five or the first eight books of the Old Testament uh, that would serve different purposes. And you have to remember, most people in the Middle Ages are illiterate. They can't read or write. Less than 15% of the population can read or write. Uh, it may have been higher than that. We don't know, but that's our best guess. And so... If you're going to know the Bible, how are you going to know it? You're going to know it through the rituals that you perform in church. And so you would go to church, and just like in church today, uh, they would sing songs, they would sing hymns, and they would read scriptures, and they would have sermons. Well, the songs they would sing would be based on the Psalms from the Old Testament, from the Bible. And so the Psalms would accompany the Mass, the liturgy. And so this is how you would kind of hear the stories of the Bible, is as, as couched into the ritual itself. Uh, and it's funny because we think of people in the Middle Ages being ignorant, but I guarantee you people in the Middle Ages who went to church knew their Bible better than we did. Because they heard it every day, because it was sung all the time. So this is a book used to support those psalms. You would have to sing the psalms or recite the psalms, and so you needed a book of just the psalms. But instead of just putting the psalms in there in writing, they wanted to illustrate them. That's really hard because the psalms are not typical scripture. There's not a story being told. It's not like a, a narrative or the story of the ten lepers being healed or the passion of Christ. There's not a narrative. Uh, there's no history like, say, the book of Samuel or the book of uh, the Kings, where you have the story of David and Solomon. Uh, it's actually a lot of poetry, and the poetry is about calling out to God and uh, praising God for his protection and also lamenting when you feel abandoned. They're very emotional. They're very much about this idea of personal salvation. That's a very, very hard thing to illustrate. So how do you illustrate that? And the artist decided to illustrate it in a very, very novel way. Uh, first of all, they decided rather than full page illustrations like this, they would put in little vignettes and the vignettes didn't have frames. They would float in the page. So where there was a psalm, you can see the psalms are numbered there. This is Psalm 22. Where the psalm was numbered, they'd put in a little header and they would put a little ink wash drawing in there. Uh, and here you can see there's the name of David to indicate this is a Psalm of David. So this one here, you have Psalm 14, but there's also Psalm 15 on the same page. And so you have these little ink wash drawings, no frames, they just float in space right there as you're reading. Really, really kind of innovative. I love how the landscape actually goes behind the text in some cases. So how do these things read? Well, let's start with Psalm 14. I'm going to read a couple psalms here to explain it. This is why I had to have the updated uh, video. This is easier to do in class, but here I really think you need to, to see the psalm. And so Psalm 14, a psalm of David, Lord, who shall dwell in thy tabernacle, or who shall rest in thy holy hill? And so here the artist has decided to show this quite literally. This is the tabernacle. This represents the the tabernacle of God. This is the altar of incense in front of it. Here's the veil. And here's a guy gesturing to it. And here's a guy shrugging his shoulders like, I don't know. So they're literally like, who shall dwell in the tabernacle? <laughs> and then who shall rest in thy holy hill? Here's a person lying down on the hill uh, at the altar with a, you know, what looks like a gospel book open. 
uh, resting in the hill. So it's almost a, a kind of literal word for word depiction of it. He that walketh without uh, he that walketh without blemish and worketh justice. And so here we see a person here working justice. Notice he has a scale and he is helping these individuals here. So he's working justice. He that speaketh truth in his heart, who hath not used deceit in his tongue, nor hath done evil to his neighbor, nor taken up a reproach against his neighbors. And so we see that kind of being played out here. This is the person who is speaking openly before God has truth in his heart. It's really interesting. In his sight, the malignant is brought to nothing, but he glorifieth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his neighbor and deceiveth not. Um, he that hath not taken out his money to usury, nor taken bribes against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall not be moved for evil. And so here is a person with scales indicating this person who is not taking advantage of the downtrodden over here. Uh, so there is this kind of almost literal representation of these ideas. Some of them get a little bit more figurative, and some of them uh, work towards uh, typology. Typology is where you analogize. Here's the next psalm, and this psalm is illustrated down here below. Uh, psalm 15, the inscription of a title to David himself, Preserve me, O Lord, for I have put my trust in thee. I have said to thee, O Lord, thou art my God, for thou hast no need of my goods. To the saints who are in his land, and so in this case, again, we show to the saints who are in his land. So we see a congregation of saints, of holy people gathered together. Who are in this land, he hath made wonderful all my desires in him. Their affirmities were multiplied. Afterward, they made haste. I will not gather together their meetings for blood offerings, nor will be I uh, mindful of their names on my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. It is thou that will restore my inheritance to me. And so here we see a guy holding forth the cup, indicating here is the chalice that he is holding. So when we say, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance to my cup, the lions are fallen unto me in a goodly places, for my inheritance is goodly to me. I will bless the Lord who hath given me understanding. Moreover, my reins also have corrected me even till night. I set the Lord always in my sight, for he is at my right hand, and I will not be moved. And so here you see the Lord uh, and the angels on either side, right hand. And he said, therefore, my heart will be, have been, have been glad and my tongue hath rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh sh also shall rest in hope. Okay. So here's where things get a little more interesting. These are people laying in their infirmities, by the way, I forgot that. So these are the people laying in infirmities that will be healed. This is a tomb and at the tomb is an angel. And here we have three women. And this is actually a direct reference to this, and my flesh shall also rest in hope. This is the story of the resurrection. So resurrection morning, Easter morning, which we're coming up on, uh, the three Marys go to the tomb and an angel uh, says, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? So in this case, the artist has decided not just to kind of give a literal illustration, but to give a typology saying, oh, this is a reference to the resurrection. So more of my flesh all shall also rest in hope. Why shall you rest in hope? From a Christian perspective, you shall rest in hope because you have a hope of resurrection because Christ himself will help you be resurrected. Because that will not leave my soul in hell, nor wilt thou give thy Holy One to see corruption. And so here we actually see Christ himself bending over. I love this little drapery flying out back. And he's reaching down to pull people out of the pit. Uh, it says, because that will not leave my soul in hell, nor thou give thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt fill me with joy and thy countenance at thy right hand are delights even to the end. So we have this wonderful mixture of kind of literal and typological interpretation where the artist is is imagining what could this reference? What historical moments could this reference? Here's another one. This is Psalm 44. Psalm 44 is all about this discussion about how they feel abandoned. And it was always analogized to the captivity of the Jews. And so what we see here are people pleading at the altar, again, to the tabernacle, to the temple. And here they are pleading, running to the temple when all the enemy is at the gates and running in. And so this could be analogized to the conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, so it's really fun. And then you can see how it is this really quick, light, sketchy style. It's uh, quite beautiful. Uh, I love medieval art for this reason, because medieval art is always multivalent. It never has one meaning. It always has multiple meanings. Uh, the Carolingians just richly produce these magnificent manuscripts. This is Codex Aureus. This is the golden uh, book of St. Emmeram. And this one was probably commissioned by Charles the Bald. This is the grandson 
to Charlemagne. And in this case, what we have is a scene of the 24 elders. This is a scene coming out of the book of Revelation. This is the adoration of the lamb over here. Here are the 24 elders gathered around them. And here you see, again, allegorical classical figures indicating place. What I love, though, is here is Charles the Bald himself. Let me grab a different pen color. This pen color isn't working out. Let me go up white. So here is Charles the Bald himself. He is gathered by his entourage. He is under a baldican. Very important guy, obviously the king. But what I love is that these two pages are opposite each other in the book. And notice his sight line. He is looking towards the lamb. And he has a hand raised and a gesture of awe and veneration. So even though he is the person who's the patron of this book, who funded this beautiful book, he is acknowledging that he is seeing this visionary space that you are seeing on the opposite page, tying him. Uh, you always have to read these, these books spatially, not just, uh, you know, kind of literally, but spatially how they work. Uh, this is another beautiful object from the, the Carolingian period. This is from the Lothar crystal. Lothar is another one of these descendants of uh, Charlemagne who became king. Uh, Charlemagne split his kingdom up amongst his three sons, and then it gets reunited briefly under Charles the Bald, but uh, it basically breaks into the various kingdoms of, of uh, Europe after that. And again, it's another wonderful classical object. Uh, this is a carved rock crystal. So this is a quartz crystal. Uh, and this is a recreation of a technique uh, known as reverse intaglio. Intaglio was when they would carve gemstones like Chalcedony uh, and Onyx, and they would carve these into signet rings or symbols. But the great thing about quartz is quartz is clear. So if you carve it, you know, to, to see the image on an intaglio, uh, you had to look closely or you had to press it into wax uh, to see the image. But if you carve a rock crystal in reverse and then polish the backside, so this thing is uh, an image of St. Paul carved in from the backside, uh, you can see him through the front. So it looks like it's three-dimensional, even though it's carved in. It's really kind of cool. So this is a very uh, ancient technique. This is a technique that was pioneered by Romans. They built lots of these beautiful uh, carved crystal reverse intaglios. Uh, and this is a massive intaglio. And this was carved um, by, or not by, but on behalf of Lothar. Uh, when we look at it, it's really ornate. Unfortunately, it's been cracked. You can see the, the crack there. In this case, it's going to go back to red. You can see the crack through the center of it, but it has an amazing amount of scenes throughout. So let's look at the figures. First of all, when you look at the figures, Notice how well proportioned they are. Notice how beautiful the drapery is. Notice the dynamic range of figures. Some are three quarters, some are frontal view. Uh, here we have a figure being grabbed by the hand. Uh, really dynamic gesturing going on. Uh, the architecture is a little small, but that's okay. You know, that's, it's trying to deal with the conventions of space. But otherwise, this is really a masterful piece of, of return to classicism. So what's the story going on here? Well, this is actually a story out of um, uh, what we call the Jewish Apocrypha. The Jewish Apocrypha is this uh, collection of writings that were part of the Bible uh, in the Middle Ages. It's funny, they're uh, not part of the Middle Ages today. I mean, excuse me, they're not part of the Bible today uh, because today uh, we've removed large chunks of, of the story. Uh, from the Bible. But if you go back uh, to the Middle Ages, this was a whole collection of writings. And they usually tell the stories of the Jews in exile. They tell the stories of the Jews in the Babylonian captivity. One of those stories is the story of Susanna. And Susanna is the hero of the story. That's why it's sometimes called the Susanna Crystal. And the story starts out with Susanna. Susanna was minding her own business, and she was bathing. Well, you bathe in the nude, of course. Uh, but she was doing it inside in an enclosure or on the roof of her house under the parapet of the wall. And two elders of the Jewish faith climb a tree and sneak into the enclosure. And they see her, they're horrible peeping toms, and they decide to proposition her for sex, solicit her for sex. And she, being a virtuous woman, says, not just no, but heck no, and refuses. And now they have a problem because they say, holy crap, uh, 
we've propositioned her for sex and now she can implicate us. So it's kind of a me too moment. Uh, and so they decide to accuse her of prostituting herself to them and soliciting them. And so not only have they, you know, voyeuristically looked at her and, and besmirched her honor, now they're going to lie. And, and this is a, a crime that she could be condemned to, to death. So we have the two elders again, and the elders present the story to other people. Then we have Susanna. Susanna here is being accused. You have the elders pointing hands. I love how everybody is in shock. It's like, oh, that's slut. How could they? Uh, and then you actually see poor Susanna. I love this scene. Her hand is on her face in shame, and yet she's being led by the hand uh, to judgment. Um, and then ultimately here uh, facing this judgment. The whole thing comes to a crux in the center. So the narrative kind of goes around the outside counterclockwise, spirals into the center, and then it kind of has its end scene over here. And here we see Susanna in the center, her hands spread out in a gesture of prayer. We see um, the individuals who are condemning her. And then over here, we have Daniel. Daniel is Daniel the prophet from the Bible. And Daniel uh, sees her, and Daniel, by virtue of being prophet, has the gift of spiritual um, uh, um, discernment. And so he can say, wait a minute, she's the innocent one. It's actually the elders who are the guilty party. And so the elders actually get their comeuppance and get, you know, stoned to death. Okay. And so you actually get to see them. Love the dynamic action. It's a beautiful classical piece. Uh, I'm just going to go back here. So the real question is, man, this thing must have been an amazing amount of money and time to create. Um, it's quite large. It's um, been over three inches in diameter. Uh, uh, so the question is, why would Lothar make this? This was made as a devotional object and given to a church as a kind of devotional object by Lothar himself. Now, kings give devotional objects or gifts to churches all the time, chalices, plates to show their munificence. But this is such a peculiar object, uh, this kind of reverse intaglio and such a wealthy object. We almost feel like we have to have a, a really complicated reason for why he would go to this effort. Well, it turns out there is a story that's related. So Lothar had a wife and his wife was Tautberga. So those of you looking for baby names, Tautberga. It's a great girl's name. So Tautberga uh, was unfortunately barren. And so Lothar wanted an heir. So he took up with a mistress, uh, produced an heir, but he wanted that heir to be legitimate. So he divorced Tautberga. Uh, of course, Tautberga did nothing to deserve this. And this is against Catholic law and dogma. So the local bishop, a guy by the name of Hinkmar, said, uh, no, you don't just get to divorce your wife because you don't want to be married anymore and because she didn't produce an heir. We, you know, we, we have rules uh, and you can't do that. And Lothar the king said, well, you know, screw you, Hinkmar. And he deposes Hinkmar. So Hinkmar is the local bishop and he deposes him. Uh, Hinkmar then goes to the pope goes to the Rome, goes to Rome, goes to the Pope and says, uh, are you going to let this stand? And the Pope says, heck no. So the Pope goes back to Lothar and said, okay, not only <laughs> are you going to reinstate Hinkmar, you are going to put away your mistress and you are going to uh, um, reinstate Tautberga as the rightful queen. Uh, you have done unjustly to her and you've committed adultery against her, but she's just. So you see what's going on here. Um, and there's two ways to read this stone. Okay, on one level, Susanna is uh, Tautberga. She is a woman that's been falsely accused and been put away and been falsely judged. And Hinkmar then stands in the position of David. Now, excuse me, David, but Daniel. Uh, and Daniel restores her to her rightful position. But then the other way to read it is Hinkmar, that Susanna is actually Hinkmar. That when Lothar tried to get rid of him, uh, this was a false accusation against Hinkmar. And so Hinkmar goes to the Pope. In this case, Daniel is the Pope who restores Hinkmar. So either way, this is a story of false accusation and restoration of people who were innocent. And so it seems that whether you read this as Tautberga or Hinkmar, and I think it's probably meant to read as both, this is a story that marks this wonderful uh, kind of moment of 
restoration of false accusation and restoration to the correct order. Uh, and it shows just how, frankly, a, a, amazingly well-balanced uh, the difference between church and state was in the medieval world. Here's Lothar trying to get his way. He's king. Ultimately, he can't get his way. Uh, and so he was probably required to submit this object to the church. Uh, and this story was probably suggested to him by someone uh, as evidence of his penance that he recognizes that he did wrong. Really, really interesting. Uh, kind of fun stuff. One of the other things that uh, the Carolingians do is they build a lot of churches. Again, they want to give the impression of a stable empire. So they build long-lasting churches. And this is where we have the introduction of a major feature of medieval architecture. Up to this point, we've, we've talked a lot about a couple of pieces of, of medieval architecture. We've talked about the Basilica plan, the Latin cross plan. We've talked about the transept and the apse. But now we have a new thing called the Westwork, or the Westwork if you prefer. Uh, the Westwork um, is this massive tower and facade on the front of the building. Uh, you might ask, what is this for? Well, for one, it incorporates the bell towers. Uh, bell towers used to be entirely separate buildings, so this might just be a convenient way of, of saving on construction costs, but it also provides another real interesting feature. It has a gallery, and the gallery is unique because the gallery in this case allows a place for the king to visit where he can actually go and look down into the church. Uh, so he can, again, it's a place where the king or the noble or the, or the bishop can come and visit. He can be separated by the masses, but he can still be accessible. Uh, he can also turn around and go out to the balcony on the front and address larger crowds. We often think of churches in the Middle Ages as the action happening inside, but the truth is the inside of the church is really only for the highest and most holy masses. It is the outside where people gather for a lot of popular events. And so this is a place where you could address people. And it also creates an imposing facade on the front of the church that announces it. This is a church. And so this is a really important innovation on medieval architecture, and we're going to see this innovation continue when we go into the next period. Well, that gets us through the Carolingians. The next group to talk about is the Etonians. So Charlemagne's descendants uh, eventually start bickering amongst themselves. The empire splits, and we have a new dynasty, uh, a new family line come to power in the east. And this pretty much solidifies the break between east and west. It's weird to think that France and Germany were once part of the same family. Uh, they've had so many wars amongst each other, they seem so different linguistically, culturally, but they did start out in the same place. Uh, the eastern half continues the title of the Holy Roman Empire. They get the title, and we have a new dynasty come to power uh, that are descendants from a guy named Henry the Fowler. And Henry the Fowler has a son, uh, and that son is Otto I. And Otto I names his kid Otto II, who names his son Otto III, and so yada, yada, yada. Hence, we call them the Etonians. There were a bunch of Charles in the Carolingians, so we call them the Carolingians. Uh, these have a bunch of people named Otto, and so we call them the Etonians. Uh, the Etonians are really interesting because they consolidate all the gains made under the Carolingians. They're actually a lot more powerful politically and uh, economically than uh, even the Carolingians were. And you can demonstrate this because not only do they hold on to the title of the Holy Roman Empire, they actually marry into the Byzantine Empire. Otto II uh, manages to secure a marriage to Theophanu, and Theophanu is a Byzantine princess from the East. So again, it, it shows that they're conscientiously trying to recreate uh, this union of what the old Roman Empire was. Uh, and so Otto II marries Theophanu, a Byzantine princess, and she becomes the mother of Otto III. And a lot of Byzantine customs come into the German court. And not only does she bring uh, a lot of money and prestige, she almost certainly brings her artists. So when we look at the artwork of the Carolingians, it's very, very classical. It's They're clearly looking at late classical uh, Roman prototypes, but the Etonians are probably looking at Byzantine prototypes. And if you remember, the Byzantines had moved in a direction away from classicism. So when we look at this, there isn't the same believable drapery or sense of modeling that we see in the Carolingians. Instead, it looks flatter. It looks more graphic. It looks more like 
the Byzantine East, which is what we would come to expect. The Etonians uh, continue this tradition of building churches. They build a lot of these big churches. And they also continue the building of the westwork as well. So we have large westworks and apses on the one facade. Notice that we still haven't recreated vaulting. That vaulting from uh, the classical period is not yet here. It will come, but not till the Romanesque period. The roofs are still flat roofs made with wooden trusses. Where the Etonians uh, really shine is in their manuscripts. Again, Carolingian manuscripts have a little bit of gold. Etonian manuscripts just have tons of gold. The Etonians were extremely wealthy. Uh, they also were very, very powerful. The Carolingians were pretty much put in line by the popes uh, and depended on the popes for their legitimacy, so they had to kowtow to the popes. The Etonians are so powerful that they actually put their <laughs> relations on the papal throne, uh, and the popes are German uh, popes. In fact, there had not been a German pope until Pope uh, from the Middle Ages until Pope Benedict XVI, who was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, and just a little piece of, uh, if you're a Pope watcher, and yes, I'm a Pope watcher. I, I look at the fashion of the Popes uh, because uh, Pope Benedict was uh, really trying to tie into his German medieval heritage and the German Etonian Popes. So he revitalized a lot of the customs from that time period, including red shoes and wearing the, the Saturno, the red hat, which was a medieval hat that Popes wore and hadn't worn for, you know, years and years, uh, decades, centuries even. So there's a little uh, Pope watching inside uh, culture for you. I bet you never knew that there were Pope watchers like there were royal watchers, but there are. <laughs> okay. Uh, boy, these, these lectures are revealing far more about me than I ever wanted to. Anyhow, so when we look at Etonian manuscripts, the, the way you recognize an Etonian manuscript, they just have all of this gold, luscious gold, huge backgrounds of gold, but they tend to be very flat. So look at the drapery here. The drapery doesn't really reveal the anatomy in any way. It's more stylized. Good gravery. What is happening with Peter's legs here? I mean, how does a leg even do that? It's crazy. Uh, so you can see how flat and graphic it is. This is the Byzantine influence. This is the washing of the feet on Holy Thursday. Uh, this is where Christ washes the feet of all the apostles. You can see this guy's taking his sandal off, and here he is washing the feet of Peter. And this happened indoors, but we just have a kind of schematized... Uh, you know, kind of scene of a building here to indicate it. Of course, the gold background, as in the Byzantine tradition, indicates that you're not looking at the real scene, you're looking at a spiritual scene. It's the scene over here that I think is, is really the most remarkable. Uh, when we look back at it, uh, this is, again, an author portrait. But let's consider the previous author portraits that we've seen. So when you see an author portrait from the Carolingian period, it's pretty much a simple, straightforward portrait. It shows them writing on scrolls or books, uh, there might be a symbol indicating which uh, author it is. In this case, you can see we have the angel over here, which indicates this is Matthew. This has an eagle, which indicates this is John. Uh, we even have those in the Book of Kells, but highly stylized. But here we have Luke, and you can recognize Luke because Luke has the ox. And so this is the evangelical symbol of, of Luke. But instead of the simple scene <laughs> we have this really trippy scene luke doesn't just have uh, one book he has a lap full of books and that's because luke wrote multiple books wrote luke wrote acts as well as the gospel of luke he was also ascribed to paul so he might be some of the he might have been the the penman the scribe uh, the clerk as it were on some of the letters of paul uh, but instead of him showing in an act of writing he is surrounded in this green almond-shaped body halo that we call a mandorla, M-A-N-D-O-R-L-A, a mandorla. And he is holding these radiant spheres that are just sending out rays of light. And the radiant spheres are filled with images of angels. But at the top, we have prophets holding scrolls. At the very top is David himself. David was a prophet because he talked about the Messiah in the Psalms. And so... Uh, He's just, this is more than you need to indicate this is Luke. Uh, and then we have rivers of living water coming out of his feet, uh, out where he stands, and then sheep who are drinking. So what's going on here? Again, this is a kind of mystical scene. If you remember those Byzantine scenes like the Transfiguration in, uh, in San Apollinaire in Classe, uh, they're really trying to give a deeper message. And the deeper message here is that when you open up the book of Luke, you are seeing the fulfillment of thousands of years of prophecy. 
You are seeing the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and Luke is opening this to you. And by this, you receive the living waters of, of life. You see the living waters of Christ into your person. So these sheep are you, just as these sheep are receiving and drinking of waters of life. You, by reading the scriptures, are receiving this. And so you don't just get Luke, you get this huge, massive, visionary scene. Again, Byzantine art, medieval art, is trying to give you the, the, the scene beyond, not just the one level of seeing things, but all of the other levels of meaning that exist. You're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy of the ages. Uh, and then we also see, you know, kind of wonderful scenes as well. This is the gospel book of Otto III. This is where Otto III puts in a portrait of himself. Because, hey, he's the king. He paid for it. He gets a portrait too. Uh, and so we see him in all his magnificence, uh, holding his orb and scepter, indicating that he is the ruler, surrounded by his bodyguards and also by the members of the clergy. But what I love is this scene here. These are all of the provinces over which he has control. And you can see them there. They are provinces like Germany and Gaul and Rome. And they are personified as women. And these women have crowns, but the crowns look like cities or buildings. These are Tyche figures. These are classical figures that represent personifications of cities or provinces. And they are bringing gifts to indicate that he is the ruler over all of these areas. So, hey, yeah, yes, you get to see the visionary stuff, but you also get to see uh, the king in all his glory. One of the things that uh, happens because of the Etonians is a revitalization of sculpture in a way that we hadn't seen before. And you can see this in these marvelous set of doors. These are the doors of Bishop Bernward, and they, uh, Bernward, and they were originally installed in St. Michael's Hildesheim in Germany. So Bernward uh, was a bishop uh, from the Etonian period in the 11th century, and he takes a trip to Rome. And when he goes to um, the Vatican in Rome, he goes to Old St. Peter's, and Old St. Peter's had a massive set of bronze doors. And on that, those bronze doors was figural decoration. Now, these bronze doors were spoilia. They were not bronze doors made by any Christian. They were actually bronze doors taken from a Roman temple. Uh, this technique of spoil that we talked about in the Arch of Constantine was a very established practice in the late Roman world. It was a way of saying, hey, see, the past isn't gone. We have surpassed the past, and we are the continuing tradition of the past. And he just marveled at the scale and the size of these doors. And so he said, well, they had big fancy doors. I want big fancy doors. So he goes back home to Germany, and he commissions the creation of these massive doors. Of course, he being Christian, he doesn't want doors with pagan themes. He wants doors with Christian themes. And the doors are really a technological marvel. Uh, they weigh several tons each. Just to give you a sense of the height here, uh, this door handle here, this lion door handle, uh, is about my height. <laughs> I'm very not very tall guy, uh, but still. Uh, so that's about, you know, that would come about right to my face. Uh, so these are tall doors. They're 12 feet tall. They're really, really impressive doors. Uh, and so on one part, they're just a, a technological marvel. No one had cast something in bronze like this uh, on this scale for maybe 400, 500 years. Uh, in the Byzantine Empire, they were casting a few big bronzes, but not much else. And so there was a loss of technical skill that was represented in this, that this is a return to a uh, form of the classical past. We're going to make these large single bronze castings. Now, the funny thing is the bronze doors on Old St. Peter's were actually cast as separate panels. They were actually, each individual panel was cast separately. But this thing was cast as two massive panels, one door on one side and one door on the other, single castings. Uh, they did it that way because they didn't know how the Romans had made it. So they said, oh, let's just give it a shot and cast it all at once. It's kind of a miracle that it actually worked. Maybe this isn't the first attempt. Uh, and so this return to monumental sculpture and monumental castings, something we hadn't seen in 500 years. So that shows how the Middle Ages are, are, are gaining and, and moving back towards classical tradition. The relief on them is quite high. Uh, and again, realize, you know, average human is standing somewhere around that height. So here is an average human standing there. So you're looking up at these. 
So the figures actually come off of the surface. You can see the shadows underneath them. The heads are almost entirely free. So these are halfway between reliefs, which are attached to a ground, and halfway towards you know, sculptures in the round. And they kind of lean out towards you so that you can see them. Uh, again, if you're looking up at them, that makes sense. Uh, the detailing on them is really superb too. Now, the anatomy isn't the best. Again, we're still talking about a loss in, in some tradition and knowledge. So the anatomy isn't quite the best, uh, but we do have really nice figures fully round heads, uh, bodies that are fully rendered, some very wonderful dramatic drapery. Uh, this is a little bit stylized, so it's a bit more back to the Byzantine tradition. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, the uh, Adam and Eve and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. So here we have God pointing the accusatory finger towards Adam saying, hey, did you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And he said, yes, but, you know, it was the woman. He points under his arm, so he passes the buck. But with the other hand, he covers himself with fig leaves. And then Eve passes the buck again and passes it down to this dragon-like serpent here, uh, which is the figure that tempted them to take it. So it's the scene of the expulsion and the fall of man from the Garden of Eden. Now, there's several different themes here as you look at it. Uh, on one side, we have New Testament themes. And those New Testament themes uh, start at the bottom and go towards the top. And on the other side, we have Old Testament themes. But here the narrative reads in the opposite direction and reads from the top down. So what's going on here? Well, to explain what's going on here, I'm going to pull in on a detail of just the upper uh, eight panels, just the, the four on the left and four on the right to give a sense of what's going on. Again, Everything in the Middle Ages is multiple meanings, multiple interpretations. Nothing is ever simple. The Middle Ages, they didn't just think one layer. They thought 18 different layers. And so they want to express different truths. So the first level of this is narrative. So starting on the one side, we have the creation of Adam. Uh, God leans over and breathes the breath of life into Adam. And then in the next scene, we see Adam being presented to Eve. Uh, you know, this is uh, the wife of Adam, and so he creates Eve out of the rib of Adam and, and presents them to her. You can see God is a little bit bigger than everybody else. Then in the next scene, we have the fall. We have Adam and Eve together. Eve is holding on to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, eating the forbidden fruit, and she's getting Adam to eat. And then the next scene is that scene we saw previously, the expulsion, where God says, hey, did you eat of the fruit? And everybody passes the buck until it eventually lands on the serpent. So this narrative reads from top to bottom. There's a bunch of scenes that go on with the uh, slaying of, of uh, Abel by Cain, but we'll leave that off for the moment. Uh, on the other side, we have the New Testament. So over here, starting on this side, we have Christ before Pilate. Christ is being judged by Pilate, and Pilate is washing his hands. Then the next scene, we see the crucifixion. Uh, then the next scene is the Marys at the tomb, which um, has... Uh, a scene where the three women come to the tomb and the angel is sitting there at the tomb saying, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? So this is the first sign of the resurrection. Then we get to a scene here, which is somewhere between the Nole me tangere, uh, they don't touch me scene, where Christ is there. Notice that Christ is resurrected. He's holding a staff with a cross on it, just so you can tell. And this is him telling him, I'm going to ascend to my father. And so again, this is confirmation of the resurrection. Uh, and notice that these scenes go up. But there's also a relationship of these two images across. Let's start with the top scene. The top scene, the theme is paradise or heaven. Man is created into a state of paradise. God wanted us to be happy, and he gave us this perfect garden to live in. And on the other side, Christ is ascending back to heaven to be with his father. The next scene is the creation of Eve, and that parallels the scene of the Marys or the women at the tomb. So the theme here is women. And the implication is, and again, don't account me, call me sexist for this. This is a medieval interpretation. I'm just here to teach it. That by women's sin and original sin, the Catholic dogma of the original sin comes into the world. And But there is a corollary to that, that the women are the most devoted and the most um, 
best representatives of Christ's disciples. They're the most faithful, and they're the ones who are given the witness of the resurrection first. And remember that it is a woman by a woman that Christ, the Savior of the world, comes back into the world, uh, the Virgin Mary. And in fact, the Virgin Mary is often described as the new Eve. So Eve brings man into the world, but Mary brings Christ into the world, and by Christ men are redeemed. The next one is the fall. You'll notice that the tree has a very cross-like shape. That's not accidental. And of course, the cross itself is made out of woods. It's often a kind of tree-like motif. The idea being here is that we, by our own free will, chose uh, to sin, and so mankind sinned and fell. But Christ, by being risen up on a tree, actually achieves the redemption of mankind, the atonement of mankind. And then the next scene is judgment. In the expulsion, God is justly judging man for his willful sinful act against God. But on the other scene, we have man in the person of Pontius Pilate falsely judging or incorrectly judging Christ, who is God. So you have these wonderful parallels, these wonderful typologies that are made across the way. This thing is not just meant to be read up or down it's meant to be read up and down and across. It has many, many levels of meaning. And as we get into the Romanesque period, and as we get into the Gothic period, you're going to see this more and more. You're going to see this more and more all the time. You're going to see this incredibly complex layered typology and meaning where there is several different mystical meanings beyond just the surface meaning. And one of the last things this is the last image of the slide. I know we're going a little bit long, but you know we're not going that long. Remember, every lecture is an hour and 15 minutes, and so you can watch these at your leisure. Uh, so it's just going to take a few minutes to wrap up this last image. We also see during the Etonian period a return, not just to monumental bronze castings, but to monumental sculpture. Uh, monumental sculpture had died out as a matter of taste. It, it, it really wasn't very popular. Instead, they preferred to make these monumental mosaics uh, or monumental frescoes. But monumental sculpture really had kind of died out towards the late antique period. But here we see it returning. And this isn't a very large statue. It's uh, about four, four and a half feet high. It's not quite life size, but it's probably larger than anything that had ever been created before. And it was created to be a crucifix to hang over the altar at Cologne. Uh, it's currently in Cologne Cathedral, but uh, it, this was there in the Precursor Church. Again, painted to be lifelike. So first, just it's the, it's the first time we've seen monumental sculpture on this scale in a very, very long time. But there's also something else going on here. Notice the figure. Notice that it, it has this real sense of the strain of the muscles. Christ's head isn't, um, you know, erect. It's sagging. This is the dead Christ. His hips sway to the side. You can really see the muscles being pulled taut from the weight of the body on the nails uh, put through the hands. And it kind of emphasizes his death and the suffering and the grotesque nature of his death. This is actually a departure from earlier scenes of crucifixion. Uh, let me just pop back here to show a crucifixion from an earlier medieval time that we've already taken a look at. This one from the Jalone uh, Sacramentary. Uh, notice this is the dead Christ too, but his eyes are open, his head isn't sagging. There's no sense of the weight of the body. So, but there's something else going on here. It's not just an increase in style, it's a change in emphasis. Um, Christians we're still arguing about the nature of Christ's sacrifice. How does the, the Christ's sacrifice actually achieve our redemption? And there were all kinds of different theories on this. This is something that, you know, Christians today don't really argue that much about. Um, one of those was, one of my favorite arguments is that it was kind of a trick, that uh, God tricked Satan into killing him. That way he could take him to the underworld, to Hades, to hell. And once there, he would reveal himself as the master of death and hell, because he is the creator of the universe. He would knock down the gates of hell and harrow, it's called the harrowing of hell. And he would release all of the, the souls that were damned there and, and give them a second chance on life. So, you know, there's all kinds of different mechanisms of how this could take place. Uh, but early Christianity didn't focus on one of those kind of ideas. One of those ideas is the substitutionary atonement. That is that 
Christ's personal suffering is what paid for you. That it's Christ's suffering on the cross that pays for your sins. But this was an idea that was growing in popularity uh, around the uh, end of the uh, 10th and beginning of the 11th century. And so there is a real move to show Christ as not just dead and just kind of standing there and posing like we saw in that other crucifi uh, crucifixion scene, but to show him his suffering, to show that his suffering connected to your suffering. So that when you look up this, look at this and you see the dead Christ, you feel these pangs of guilt and this will move you towards penance and, and uh, repentance so that therefore you too can take um, advantage of his suffering to save you from your suffering. And there's also a liturgical purpose here. So remember that this is hanging over an altar. The altar is where you as a Christian of the medieval world would come to meet the artifacts of the atonement. The atonement is achieved through the taking of what uh, a Catholics call the Eucharist or the host, uh, what other Christians call the communion, what Mormons call the sacrament. This is the bread and the wine that represent the flesh and the blood of Christ. So as you come to the altar to take of this, the take of the Eucharist, you are to be reminded of his suffering. Plus there's a new doctrine that's emerging at this time, uh, the transubstantiation. The transubstantiation actually doesn't become official Catholic dogma until much, much later. But it's an idea that's percolating at this time, that somehow, mystically, the bread is transformed literally into the flesh of Christ. And so you are there um, consuming the flesh of Christ at the altar. And so it's very appropriate to look up and see the body of Christ, because that's what you're being reminded of. That's what you're consuming as you're there. So all of these things work together to make it a much more visceral experience, a much more personal and intimate experience for the adherent, for the worshiper at the altar. That's a very important aspect of medieval art. Medieval art is never just art for art's sake. It's never just frippery or decoration. It is there to hammer home certain spiritual or mystical truths and to make them personal. And so it's always related to the ritual that's happening at the site or your experience that's happening at the site. Uh, okay, so that's a good place. So that wraps up uh, early medieval. We will move on to Romanesque. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.